Welcome to this course and in this particular course we are going to learn everything about OAuth 2 and its implementation with Spring Boot and React. Yes, we are going to also build a front end. So first we are going to start with building the back end wherein we are going to implement OAuth 2 and we are going to build out a login with Google, login with GitHub. Okay, you, if you have used uh, other website you must have seen uh, the login with Google and login with GitHub. Uh, uh, buttons on the websites, right? So I'm going to show you how you can build that out using Spring Boot. And yes, we are also going to have a front end, which is going to help us understand how things work if you have a front end in place. And we are going to have the front end built out in React, right? Which we are going to code from scratch. So you will have a complete picture of how an end to end flow from front end to back end works when you are building such a functionality for your users. So if you have a project wherein you need to implement OAuth 2, then this is going to be super useful. If you find my content really helpful, I would encourage you to subscribe and uh, like this particular video. Also share to show your support. And uh, wherever you are joining in from, I would love to know you more. So in the comment section down below, let me know who you are, where you are joining in from and what sort of videos should I bring in on this channel. Okay. So the list that I have of upcoming videos is highly influenced by the comments and the user requests that I get. All right. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So now it's time that we begin talking about what is OAuth 2 and why do we need them? All right. Now, before getting into the details of OR2, I want you to take a step back. So we'll take a step back and we'll first understand how things worked before OAuth. And uh, this will help us understand what problems the world had before OAuth was bought in. And uh, then we will talk about how OAuth fills the gaps and the problems that occurred earlier before this thing was even implemented or invented. So first, how things worked is before OAuth, if a third party application needed to access your data from another service, okay? Uh, now what I mean by this is, for example, like you are uh, trying to access uh, Gmail contacts, uh, let's say, to send invitations from a third party application, okay? So you will have to connect your Gmail today, right? But early on, you had to provide your login credentials, like your username and password to that third party application. So for example, if I'm trying to access Gmail contacts to send invitations from a third party application, how would I allow that third party application to access my contacts? Because they are in my Gmail account, the Google account. So I have to share my credentials with them and they would allow me to access the contacts, right? Now this approach had several problems. Now what were the problems? Let's talk about one by one. Of course, the first problem that is pretty obvious and even you can imagine is security risk. So you are directly sharing your password with a third party application. And this means that you are trusting them to keep it secure. And this might not always be the case. You don't know how they are storing the password. You don't know whether they'll misuse your password or not, right? It's just like a promise uh, or it's just like a trust that you're putting in them and you are grieving your credentials. And if the third party application was compromised or hacked, your password could be exposed as well. And this is one of the major security risk or a problem that I, I should say with this method. Limited control. Now, once you have shared the password with the third party service or the third party application, the application had full access to your account, right? So you have given your password, it has access to your emails, it has access to your calendar, all of that, right? There is no limitation on what it can access and what it cannot. So whatever you were able to access with those credentials, the third party application is also able to access and you don't know what they are accessing, right? And there is no ability to restrict what data the application could access and you didn't have control as to how long they'll be able to access, right? So the control is very limited. This is a problem number two. Third problem is inconvenience. So if you had to change your password or and if you wanted to, uh, so for example, if you want to revoke the access, how would you do so? You had to change your password, right? And if you change your password, the access would be revoked, 
so so that's how things worked and uh, how things would happen is let's say if you have shared your password with three of the applications the third party applications right and let's say if you want to revoke access of one of the application from them so how would you access uh, how would you revoke the access you would change the password now changing the password would revoke the access from all the application and not just the one that you had to right and this was a little bit inconvenient out there and let's say if you don't want to revoke the access from any of the application but you just want to change the password then too the access would be revoked because the password is now changed so this was a little bit inconvenient is what i mean to say over here so these were the three major problems security risk limited control and inconvenience that we had before oauth now what is oauth so oauth stands for open authorization and it is a standard protocol so it's a protocol that is being used and it allows users to grant third party applications to access their information without sharing their passwords so earlier what we did is we shared the credentials this was not right right the world realized this is not right and there has to be a better way and that is when this protocol was brought in it is known as open authorization or oauth right and with the help of this or with the help of oauth third party applications can access the information without sharing the password now why is it needed of course oauth is needed to enable secure and easy access to user information by the third party applications without compromising the user credentials like passwords all right now oauth what problem does it solve right so it solves the problem of sharing sensitive login credentials directly with the third party applications because you don't know what the applications would do with your credentials right credentials is something that only you should be aware of right you should not share it with anyone and this is where oauth ensures that users can use different applications and services securely by only sharing the token that grants limited access to their data right so the usage of oauth involves the usage of token and the token has the information on what sort of data can the third party service can access of the individual and rather than their actual username and password like you you share the username and password so rather than doing that they have access to a token using which they can access information which is limited and defined for them okay from the server or from whichever service you are using it right so that's about oauth i hope you have a gist of oauth all right now to summarize our learning so far what is oauth oauth lets applications access your information without needing your password right they don't need the password using the oauth protocol they can access your information and oauth stands for open authorization why is it needed because it's safer of course you don't have to share your credentials your passwords with other apps right your credentials are yours you can change it whenever you want and this does not impact the services that you are using which problem is solved so the problem that is solved with oauth is of pass password sharing that you had to do early on before oauth was implemented right and this was risky how it worked before you had to give your password for every app which was unsafe and it was not convenient now how does oauth works as of today so you log in through a trusted service like google and give the permission and the app gets a special token to access your info without needing your password okay we'll talk about this in detail now let us uh, go through the terms over here okay so what are the terms involved when you talk about oauth so there are few terms that you are supposed to be aware of because if you read about oauth over the internet or you if you watch any of the videos then it's best to know these terms number one term is the resource owner or the user okay now who is a resource owner resource owner is the owner who owns the account so if it's your account so if it's my gmail account right so i am the resource owner of that account right third party application now this is the application that the user like user as in me i want to use this particular application and i want this application which is third party application to send invites to all my gmail contacts so the application that i am using is known as the third party application resource server 
Now, if I'm talking about Gmail account, the resource server over here is Google because Google has its own server that manages uh, the Gmail uh, stuff, right? So this is a server that holds the data that application wants to access. So if you are planning to send invites to all your Gmail contacts through a third party application, where do your contacts reside? Do they reside on your machine? No, they reside on the server, which is owned by Google. So that's the resource server because that contains the resource that is needed by the third party application. Authorization server. Now authorization server is the server that handles the authentication and authorization related tasks. Right now in this example that I was talking about the Gmail one, the authorization server is the Google server client. Now who is the client? So this is the application that is requesting the access to the resource server on behalf of the user. Right. So there will be an application that will be created. Okay. And uh, through that application, the access would be granted to the resources that the third party application wants to access. Okay. So that's the client over here. For example, if you want your, uh, this thing, your third party application to access GitHub or your GitHub account information, then you'll be creating a client an application that uh, will be helping the third party application with the authorization and authentication, right? So that's the client. So these are the key terms that you need to remember. Now let us take a look at an example. So let's say you want to give access to a application called print my photos, right? Now print my photos is a service that allows you to print your uh, photos that reside in the Google account. So how would you do so? Okay, you would give print my photos the access or with the help of OAuth. Now over here, the resource owner is the user who owns the Google account. All right. Third party application is the application that wants access to your photos to print them. And in this case, it's prints my photos, right? Because that is the application that is going to request Google for the permission to access your photos. Resource server. Now this is a server that holds your photos and has the data that print my photos wants to access. Authorization server. Now this is a server that will handle the authentication related tasks and authorization as well. So it's the Google server in this case. So that's the authorization server. Then you have the client and uh, this is the application that is requesting the access to the resource server, right? Then you have client, which is the application that is requesting the access to the resource server and Google photos in this case on, uh, on the behalf of the user. So now it's time we take a look at the flow and understand how things work in simple steps. All right. So how things would work is, uh, let's say we'll consider that same example where you have an application called print my photos and you want to give access to your Google photos so that it can print them on your behalf. So for giving access to Google photos, you'll have to authenticate or authorize that particular application and allow it to access your photos, right? So here is how the flow would work. The number one step is you go to that application, which is print my photos in our case, and you would, there can be a button like import your photos or something like that. I've just mentioned like you click on import photos from Google photos. So there'll be a flow wherein you click on this and you try to initiate the flow to connect that third party application to your Google account, right? And this would be done by you as the user, right? And the second step would be that print my photos, which is the application that you're using. It will send you to the Google's authorization server to log in and grant the permission. All right. So here you would see the Google's login page wherein you would be asked to sign in, right? To verify whether the credential, you are the actual user who is trying to access it. Now, once this is done, okay. Or what would happen is if this request is initiated, the third step is the Google authorization server would ask you to log in. Okay. If you have not already logged in, if you're logged in, then the next step would come into picture, but you would be asked to log in. And then if uh, it will ask you, if you want to give permissions to this application, to access your Google photos, right? And this is something common that we have seen when connecting application to our Google accounts or some other accounts or even Facebook accounts, right? This is a standard flow. You see a pop-up that, hey, this application is trying to access these all things, allow, deny, 
right? That is what would happen here. Now, once this is done, you would agree and you would uh, grant the permission, of course, if it's if that's what you intend to do. And what would happen is Google's authorization server would send a authorization code to the application, which is print my photos. All right. Now, this particular application receives the authorization code. Now, this application would send the authorization code to the Google's authorization server and it will request an access token, right? And just uh, be sure that uh, the step number four that we just saw, it just receives the Google just sends the authorization code to the application and it does not send any data or token yet. And the role of this code, the authorization code is just to get access token. That is it. So in step number five, you see, it will take that code and go to the Google's authorization server to request the access token. And as a last step, the access token that uh, print my photos or the application that gets the access token, they'll make use of the access token to request the photos to from the Google photos or resource server, right? So, so this is how the entire flow works. Okay. And, uh, this access token that the application has access to that is like a ticket, you know, whenever it needs any sort of photo from the Google account of the user, it is going to show that token, which will act as a ticket and it will be given access to that photo. That is how the entire thing would work. So this is step-by-step -step flow as to how the process works. And as you can see, there are three entities involved. One is the Google server, the user and the application that you are trying to use. All right. And the application in our case is print my photos. So this is just an example, but it can be any application. And this is the step as to how the entire flow works step by step. Right. So I hope uh, you have been able to follow along and I hope you are clear on the flow for OR2 along with its need and what problem does it solve for you. So now it's time that we talk about how our application flow is going to be. Now talking about the flow, this flow is going to give you a Hawkeye view or I should say a thousand feet overview of how the entire thing is going to work and uh, what all things we are going to need. All right. Now, one disclaimer before we start is if you don't understand everything, don't worry. I'm just depicting this flow as to how this flow will go through. Okay. And this might seem a little lengthy. Okay. So you are seeing lengthy diagram over here. Don't worry. Don't stress about it. All right. Uh, it's completely simple. I've tried my best to break it down for you. All right. And uh, if you don't understand right now, you will understand everything when we do hands-on practicals. All right. So let's jump right in. So there will be four things over here in the flow. One will be resource owner, client, authorization server, and the resource server that is Spring Boot. Now resource owner over here is the user, all right, who is acting and uh, who owns the account, okay? And he owns the account that he wants to log in with, right? And the account exists either on GitHub or on Google. Then we have client, which is nothing but the react application using which user is going to interact with our services. And uh, this react application will be open in the browser. All right. Now this client can be anything. It can be a react app. It can even be a mobile application. But for our example, we have a react application, right? It can also be an angular app if you wish to. Then we have authorization server, which is nothing but a GitHub or Google in our case the one who is going to help us uh, with the authorization and is going to help us verify the credentials, right? Because we are making use of uh, services like Google and GitHub to allow users to log into our application. And then we have a resource server, which is nothing but our backend, which is Spring Boot, right? Now what happens is the first step that happens is user or the resource owner opens the application, right? And this application is opened in the web browser right? Since it's a react application. Now this react application would get back to the user with the login options for OAuth providers, right? For example, if your application is configured for Google GitHub, it is going to display that login options, right? Then you have a click or uh, then the user clicks on the login button, right? So user selects the login button 
and chooses the method using which he wants to authenticate to our application. Now, if you have multiple OAuth providers configured like Google, GitHub, then he'll choose the appropriate one. If you have only one, either Google or GitHub, he'll choose the uh, one he wishes to choose, right? So depending on what he chooses, he is redirected to Spring Boot backend over here. So you can see the re redirection happens where the user is redirected to Spring Boot, right? And uh, here is where the flow starts for OAuth. So what happens here is the Spring Boot backend will redirect the user to the selected OAuth provider for authentication. So for example, if he has chosen uh, Google authentication, he'll be redirected to Google for the same. If he has chosen GitHub, he'll be redirected to the same, right? And what user sees is he sees a login page, all right, where he is asked to enter his credentials. So if it's a Google OAuth, he will see a Google login page. If it is a GitHub OAuth, he's going to see a GitHub login page, right? And then once he enters the uh, credentials, he's asked whether you want to authorize our application to access the credentials or access the details from your Google account. For example, here I have a couple of screenshots. So let's say a user selects a login by Google, right? So he sees this kind of a page where you can see he's asked to sign in and he's asked which account he wishes to sign in, right? And once he signs in, okay, he sees uh, this kind of a page where he's asked uh, whether he wishes to share his name, email address, language preference, profile picture, all of this with our application, right? Because this con consent is also important and it should be, uh, it should be uh, aware or user should be aware, I should say. So user should be aware as to what all information is being shared from his Google or GitHub account, okay? So here, this screenshot is for Google, but you will see a similar page for GitHub as well, all right? And over here, you will see this step, which is about credentials being validated. So the credentials are validated, and what happens is authorization server here, OAuth provider. So if the user has selected Google, it would be Google's authorization server. If it's GitHub selected, then it will be GitHub authorization server, right? So what happens is once the authorization is successful and the credentials are validated, the user is redirected with the auth code to the Spring Boot backend over here in the end, okay? You can see the user being redirected in the step number seven, right? Now, the backend receives this code. What backend does is it gets back to the authorization server and tells authorization server that, hey, this is the code that I have received. I need an access token now. So the authorization server will get back to the Spring Boot backend and returns the access token, all right? And uh, what backend will do is it will save the access token and it will fetch the user information using that token. So that token is now like a ticket that the backend can present to get the user information, right? So if it's the Google authorization server, the backend will present the uh, token to the Google server and it will fetch the details from the Google account. If it's GitHub, then it will display or it will showcase the token to the GitHub's authorization server and GitHub will get back with the details from the GitHub account, right? Then the backend will receive the user information, right? And it will save this user information in the session and in the security context. And this will mark the user as authenticated, right? Now, once the user is authenticated, he is the backend will redirect the user to the success page. Now, this success page is 100% configurable. We can configure this in our backend as to what happens or what we want to do with the user once the authentication is successful. And depending on what we wish to do, the user is redirected to the right success page. And you can see over here, the React app is redirected over here, right? And then React app is also allowed to fetch the information from the backend and this user information he can fetch and uh, this user information will be from google right you can either fetch the profile picture you can fetch the username the email address and so on all right google it will be google based information if the login method is google and it will be the github information if the login method was github right 
And then what uh, backend will do is it will send back the information that the React application has requested and it will display the information to the front end, right? So this is how the entire flow works, okay? It might seem a little bit overwhelming, but it's actually not. I've broken it down and made it pretty simple for you all. Now, one thing you need to remember is you don't need to code all of this. So with Spring Security, with the magic of Spring Security, all these steps, so these steps that I've selected over here, okay, the user information being fetched, the access token being fetched, the authorization code being exchanged, all of this is being taken care of by Spring Security internally, and you don't need to write code for all of this, right? Even the credentials validation is being taken care of, you don't need to do this. The You just need to redirect the user to Spring Boot on the right URL, depending on where he clicks in the front-end application. The login page is uh, created automatically. This entire process is being taken care automatically. Okay, you just need to configure like where the user, what should happen or where the user should be redirected in case of success. So you're only doing configuration stuff. You are not coding this stuff. And this entire thing is being taken care by Spring Security and Spring Security team has done an amazing job at uh, handling this for you all, right? So developers like us don't have to worry about writing or getting into the nitty gritties of how things will function, all right? So I hope you are clear about the entire flow and regarding these two pages, I'm sure if you are making use of uh, login with uh, Google, GitHub or Facebook, you must have seen these kind of pages early on in your life, right? Where you are being first being asked to present your credentials and then you're being asked for the permission whether the service can access things like name, username and so on, right? So I hope this was useful and I hope you have been able to follow along. So now it's time that we set up our Spring Boot project. So to create the Spring Boot project, we will head over to start.spring.io. This is our favorite website when working with Spring Boot. And this is where we will set up things. So I'll select Maven as the build tool. You can choose Gradle if you wish to. I'll make sure I have selected the latest version of uh, Spring Boot that is non-snapshot version. And here I'll say com.oauth over here. I'll keep the artifact as uh, sample over here you can keep it as sample okay and uh, i'll say demo project for spring boot o auth something like this all right or you can say project for spring boot o auth right jar and uh, java version 17 now we need to add some dependencies over here so i'll add a few dependencies that i need for my application to function in the right way now the first dependency that i'm going to need is web over here so Spring Web over here is what I'm going to add, okay? Because this is the web application that we are building. I'll also need security, okay? Spring security, that is something that I'll add. And since we are working with OAuth, so I'll add OAuth client over here, okay? There are many options when it comes to OAuth too, like a client, resource server, authorization server. So I'll just select OAuth client because this is a client that we are making. Right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explore over here. You can like explore the pom.xml if you wish to, or you can alternatively download this. So I'll say generate and I'll get this downloaded. So it will download as a zip file and I'll even extract it so that I can open it later with IntelliJ. Now, once I've downloaded the zip file, I'll open up IntelliJ. Uh, so remember, you need to also unzip it okay so after unzipping you can come over here open you can navigate to the folder where you have the uh, files extracted and over here you can see i have extracted sample over here right so this is my project that is extracted and i'll select pom.xml from within the sample folder and i'll say okay and it's asking me it's a project file would you like to open the project or would you like to open the file of course i want to open the project it's asking me whether you trust the projects in this folder. I'll say I trust it. And this is a security measure that IntelliJ has. So you can see the application open up, right? So this is the project that we are going to work on. 
and uh, if you go to pom.xml we have few things configured right like we have uh, auth client we have security and of course it's a web based application so we have a starter web dependency being added as well all right and then this is a dependency for starter test so i hope you have been able to follow along and i hope this was useful So now it's time that we begin setting up our GitHub application. So what you need to do is you need to head over to github.com, log in over there, then click on your profile over here and then head over to settings. Now under settings, if you scroll down here, you will see this option on the left hand side called developer settings. So just select that option and under developer settings, you will see GitHub apps or all the apps and personal access tokens. So I'll just select OAuth apps because we need to create a application for OAuth. Now over here, you'll see a list of all the OAuth apps that you have previously created. If you have not created, you will see an option here, new. So just select this and enter the application name. Now this is the application that you are building. Okay. You can have the application name over here that users can easily identify. All right. So here I can uh, mention the application name as OAuth. Okay, this is just a demo application. So I'll say OAuth GitHub. All right, demo over here. Now here you're being asked as to what will be the homepage URL of this application. So the homepage for this application will be HTTP and uh, I'll say localhost colon 8080, something like this. All right. Then over here, you can add the application description and here you can add the authorization callback URL. So once the authorization is done, okay, you need to add a callback URL. So I'll just enter this thing, localhost edd slash login slash oauth2 slash core slash github. Okay. So this is the URL that we are entering as the redirect URL. All right. Or the authorization callback URL. Now, this is a URL that authorization server posts the authorization code to. So basically it, it's being termed as the callback URL. Okay. So the code is being posted to this particular URL, which is later exchanged for an access token that is used to authenticate the subsequent API calls. Okay. And this endpoint is handled by the default Spring Boot OAuth extension later on. Okay. Now what this extension is, it's, it's a piece of code within spring security OAuth. All right. And, uh, and yeah, this is, this is what the entire, uh, thing or the entire setting will be for the application. All right. Now keep in mind here, I'm entering localhost 8080 here. Also you have localhost 8080. If you are deploying your application to production, you need to have the production URL over here. For example, if your domain name is abc.com, you can have abc.com over here. Okay. So you need to register a new application with the production URLs and production details, and then you need to say register over here. So the moment you say register, okay, you will see details like over here, you can see client ID and client secret. Okay. So we will need client ID and client secret both to authenticate as application to the API, which we'll make use of shortly. Okay. Now over here, you can see the application logo. So the page that the user sees, okay. So once the user enters the credentials, he see a page where uh, he's asked whether you want this application to access your GitHub details. For example, here our application name is OAuth GitHub demo. So it'll say, Hey, do you want OAuth GitHub demo to access your name, email, and username from your GitHub account? Okay. So on that page, the authorization page, you can show the logo as well if you have, okay. So that the page and the application looks much more familiar and users are aware as to whom they're giving what sort of access. All right. So this is something uh, that you can add over here. All right. Uh, so if you have a logo for your company or something, you should definitely add it um, to keep this looking professional. All right. You can even create a client secret from here. Okay, so I can say generate a new client secret and you can see this client secret is being displayed. I can copy it. All right. Now keep in mind this client secret will only be shown once. You can see 
you won't be able to see it again right now if you missed copying this or if you lost what you had copied then you have to generate a new client secret okay but you cannot see this client secret again and this is for security purpose of course all right but within our application we are going to need the client id as well as the client secret both the things right so i hope uh, you have been able to follow along so far and i hope this is useful so now we have our project created and set up in intellij with the required dependencies now what we are going to do as a next step is we are going to head over to our main application package over here which is this one and here i'm going to start defining the custom security configuration for our application all right so i'm going to say security config over here this is the class that i'm creating of course this is going to need some annotations like configuration enable web security and enable method security so i'm also enabling method level security which is fine i'll collapse this so that we have more room now here i'm going to start writing in my default security configuration so i'll first create a bean over here okay i'll say security filter chain okay so security filter chain over here this is what the return type is going to be and i'll say default security filter chain okay so this is the method which accepts http security as http over here and it throws an exception here all right so this is the method signature that i have all right and uh, what it does is it returns http dot build which is of type default security filter chain all right so this is done okay now within this method i'm going to have all my security related configuration all right so first thing is i'm going to say http dot csrf i'm going to say csrf dot or csrf and i'm going to have uh, csrf disabled this way okay first thing we are disabling csrf uh you can even so it's, it's giving you a suggestion that you can replace this lambda with a method reference i can absolutely do that all right in here i'm going to say uh okay just before semicolon we need to say dot authorize http request and i can say authorize authorize request so this is another lambda that i'm creating here and i'm going to say authorize request dot request matches or i don't need to make use of request matches yet Okay, so i'm going to just say any request dot authenticated so what i'm doing is i'm essentially telling spring security that any request that comes to the application is authenticated and we don't need any sort of csrf protection right now right this is done and what i would do one more thing is i would say form login and i would say with defaults over here okay so this is something uh, that we have set up now all right and uh, yeah this is the default configuration so disabling the csrf we need all the endpoints to be authenticated and by default we wish to have form based login for now all right now we need a user that will make use to log into our application all right so here what i'm going to do is i'm going to set up a static user using which we are going to sign in so i'm going to say spring dot security dot user dot name and i'm going to call this user as user and i'll copy this and paste it over here user dot i'll call this as password and this is password all right so this is a default user over here now what i would do is i would start the application so i would come over here and i would run the application now and uh, when you run let us see if we get any sort of errors we don't get any errors i come over here and i can say localhost colon 8080 and you're being presented with this login screen all right now this login screen is coming in because you have told spring boot or spring security that hey i need form based login all right you are you are also saying that i want all sort of uh, request to be authenticated 
So what I can do is I can say user over here and I can say password. And uh, when you like say enter, you are being redirected to this page. Okay, because there's no mapping as such. Okay, so you are seeing this as a fallback. Now what you can simply do is you can have a default success endpoint where you can redirect the user. All right. So what I would do is I would come over here. I would create a controller. Okay, a very simple controller. Greetings controller. Okay. And uh, this is a rest controller. And I'm going to say a get mapping like this. And I'm going to say public void and I'm going to say say hello over here. Okay. And this is uh, going to simply return hello. Something like this. All right. And uh, since this is returning hello, I need to return string over here. All right. And now what you can do is you have this endpoint. Okay. So this endpoint uh, is, uh, or this endpoint is on root URL so you can have this over here hello okay and I'll have this within inverted commas now what you can do is here when you are defining the form login instead of uh, having default configuration over here you can get rid of this okay and you can say form okay and you can have a success state over here so after authentication you can say default success URL okay is slash hello over here okay and you can pass in true as the second parameter so second parameter is for always use so i'm saying true and default success url is hello all right now let us run the application let's see what we see over here so the application would run fine but uh, let me clear the cookies okay so i would clear the cookies will reload you will be taken to login and here I'll enter my credential. I'll say user, I'll say password. And the moment I say sign in, I will be redirected to hello. You can see. So what we did essentially over here is we told Spring Boot that, hey, after successful authentication using form login, I want this to be my success URL, right? Rather than redirecting me anywhere, just don't redirect me anywhere. You have to redirect me over here. All right. So with this, we have uh, our Spring security working fine with a custom configuration. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here into application.properties, right? And we also need to get started and set up the OAuth settings for GitHub, right? We have the app created. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add this client ID and client secret, and I'm going to tell Spring Boot about it, right? And how am I going to tell Spring Boot about it? I'm going to tell Spring Boot about it with the help of this application dot properties. So here I'm going to say GitHub. Okay. O auth to configuration. All right. And I'm going to add a, a couple of lines of configuration. I'm going to say Spring security O auth to dot client dot registration dot GitHub dot client ID. All right, so we need to add client ID first. So it's spring security OAuth client registration GitHub client ID, right? So this, this is the property that we'll add the first one. Okay, I'll copy this, I'll paste it over here. Now after client ID, we need client secret, right? So instead of ID, I'll say secret over here. It's the same property just with secret and then over here, I also need to say scopes. So github dot scope, something like this, right? So let us define all three and let us understand how you can do it. So client ID is this over here that you see on the GitHub page. I'll add this. You have secret also. So this is a secret that we've got. I'll copy this. Okay. And I'll paste it over here. Now, when it comes to scope, okay, you need to add scope that tells the user or that tells Spring Boot what sort of application we, what sort of information, not application, what sort of information we want to retrieve from the user, okay? And uh, we want to retrieve from the user, meaning we want to retrieve from the user's GitHub account, all right? And this is important. Why is it important? Because 
you know, GitHub or any sort of O2 provider might have a lot of information about the user, right? And you as an application, if you're being given access to the account, it's not like you can fetch everything, right? There has to be some sort of limitation and some sort of rules that govern this, right? So here you need to specify the scope and whatever scope you are specifying over here, that is being shown to the user on the authorization page. So when the user is authorizing your application, when it's saying that, hey, allow this application to access these all details from my GitHub account, it is seeing the list of information that your application is accessing. And that is derived from this scope parameter over here. Okay. So if you head over to Google now, and if you search for GitHub OAuth scopes, okay. So just Google for this and you will see this link from docs.github.com building OAuth apps. So just head over to this link and you will see scopes for OAuth application, or this is the URL. You can make a note of it. And here you'll see different available scopes that we have got uh, within our, uh, that we can add actually to our application and we can request the relevant details from the user. Now I'm going to keep this very lenient. All right. Uh, I just need the user information and the email, right? So here, if you scroll, okay, we should have the user. So you can see over here, user, read user. And this gives you access to a user's profile data. This is what I want. And user's email grants read access to the user's email address. So we just want read access. We don't want to modify it, right? So I'm going to say read colon user over here. Okay, I'll come over here. I'll say read colon user, comma. I want email also. So you can add multiple scopes, okay, over here like this. Now on the authorization page, if you have added these two user will see that, Hey, this particular application. Now, what is the application name? So the application name is OAuth GitHub demo. So OAuth GitHub demo wants to access the you, your profile information and your email address allow deny. So this is what he's going to see. And if you add more in more uh, scopes over here, like user follow, or if you want a repository, access also public repos or all repos, then in that case, he's also going to see all of that. And he, ha he has a choice or an option to enable or allow or like deny it, right? So, so this is what uh, we have done. We have configured our application right now. And when I say configured, we have added the configuration into our uh, application dot properties. Once this is done, all right, what we can do is we can actually rerun our application, right? Now, when rerunning, let us see how our application behaves. So here, if you come, let me like clear the cookies. Let me reload. You're still being redirected to the login page. All right, you are not being shown the GitHub login. And there is a reason for that because you have just configured the application properties but in the security config, you are not telling Spring Boot that, hey, I want to make, make use of OAuth login, right? So that is something that you are not telling. So I'm going to comment this, all right? I'm going to come on the next line. And uh, one second. So I also need to take this closing bracket and, uh, and the semicolon with me, all right? Our closing bracket can stay over there one second. All right, something like this and I can just move semicolon with me, right? So now what I will do is I'll come over here. I'll say dot, okay? And uh, you can type in O and you can see O auth to login, right? So I'll add this over here, okay? And you can see O auth to, okay? And you can see O auth to dot. So like we had default a success URL, okay? You can have default success URL over here. So I'll just copy this default success URL part and I'll paste it over here. And we are done, right? You can see this, how we replaced form login with OR2 login, right? I hope it makes sense now. And uh, let me add semicolon in the comment also, and I'll just take this to the next or the previous line because on new line, just the semicolon looks ugly, right? So this is done. Let me run and let us see how things behave now because we have disabled the form login and now we have OAuth login in place. If I come here, let me 
head over to this page and can you see something over here right so you are seeing now the authorization with github right so you are straight away seeing this page over here okay this is the authorization page right now one thing i'll tell you over here i am logged into my github account and that is the reason why i'm not being shown the github login page ideally you will see the github login page first and then you will be redirected to this page where you can see this application name this is the application that we have created over here right and uh, you're seeing by this user this is the user and you can see what all data i'm accessing email address is read only and profile information is also read only how is this coming in over here from the scopes parameter or the scopes property that we have set in application dot properties all right and once you authorize the data is passed on to the application requesting it so the OAuth flow is working fine at least we are able to see this login page right and uh, yeah i i believe we have successfully replaced now the form login that we get by default with the OAuth login so i hope you have been able to follow along so far and i hope this was useful All right, now it's time that we need to test our application and the entire OAuth 2 flow with GitHub. So here, what I've done is I have this browser private window open. I've entered this URL localhost colon 8080 and I'm going to head over to this URL. All right. Now, the moment I hit this URL, I'm straight away being redirected to this sign in page of GitHub. Okay. Now, just observe what this sign-in page says. Okay, it says sign in to GitHub to continue to OAuth GitHub demo. Now, what is OAuth GitHub demo? You are right, it's the name of the application that we have set up, all right? So, so you can imagine how important the name of the application is, all right? For example, if you are building on an application and if you have already established a brand name, you should use that name over here and not any dummy name over here, okay? Because you can see here, this is the image, right? This is the logo where uh, that we were asked to set up here on this particular page. So whatever logo image you upload over here will appear over here to users, right? And this would act as a credibility and would uh, enable users and they, it would let users know whom they are sharing this information with, right? Because if you don't have this properly set up, it, uh, it would be like super confusing for users and they might drop off, right? So, so you should have proper things set up and you can enter your credentials over here, right? Now, if you take a look at the flow over here, you can see when uh, this, this flow was with the React application, but right now we don't have the React application yet. What happens is when the user uh, is trying to access the backend URL, he's being redirected to, so we are straight away at page number, sorry, not page number, but step number five, right? So we are being redirected to OAuth login page whenever we try to access to Spring Boot URL, right? And once we try to access the, uh, once we are being redirected to the OAuth login page, we see the login page and the authorization page. Now, let me enter my credentials over here. The moment I enter credentials, you will see the OAuth authorization page for GitHub. So I entered my credentials and uh, I'm seeing this authorization page over here. Okay, now this is a page which is asking me that, hey, do you want uh, to authorize this uh, application? And you can see my application logo appear over here, right? So whatever logo you upload will come up over here again. And uh, you're seeing the stick and it, it's saying that GitHub is sharing this information with this app, right? And uh, it has not shared it yet, but it's asking you to authorize this, right? You're seeing this application name by this user and you can click and see who user is and you're seeing what information you are sharing as well right and you're seeing where you will be redirected to right so when you say success over here you're being redirected to this particular link over here okay now let us click authorize over here right so i'll say authorize and you're being redirected to the authorized application and you'll see you being appear over here so this this appears over here uh, hello all right and you can see the endpoint we are being redirected to now why are we being redirected to this endpoint so the answer lies in the source code the answer is over here on this line 
where we are specifying that, hey, our default success URL is slash hello, right? Slash hello means the current host slash hello, right? And that is why we are being redirected over here, okay? So the authentication was successful. Now, what I want you to do is, uh, if you take a look at the flow, uh, I want you to understand as to what all things happened over here, okay? So when we said authorized, the credentials were validated and these all steps were carried out in a fraction of seconds, like from steps nine to steps, uh, I should say 12 over here, okay? This were carried out in the fraction of seconds. So there was a redirect done uh, from the authorization server to Spring Boot with the auth code. Spring Boot took the auth code and uh, got back to the authorization server and asked for uh, access token. It got the access token and then with the help of access token, it got the user information and it updated the security context to mark the user as authenticated. And, uh, and yeah, then it can uh, receive the user information and it was redirected to the success page. All right. Now success page in this case was not the React application but it was our own application itself where we had a hello endpoint and we redirected the user over there. Now, when we have the React application or the Angular application, we can update this success page that we just saw over here, right? The success URL that we saw, we can update it to the front end URL, all right? So I hope uh, you have been able to follow along. Now, I want to also show you some magic that happened, okay? So if you see this endpoint over here, so let me copy this endpoint, this URL over here that you were redirected to by your backend application and let us analyze this URL. Now I've pasted this URL here in Notepad and if you see over here, we have something called as client ID, right? So this is a client ID and uh, we also have return to parameter, like return to attribute over here, okay? And we have client ID redirect URI. You can see this redirect URI localhost slash login slash OAuth code GitHub. Okay. You have response type. Okay. And in response type, here you can see the scopes as well. Okay. Read user, user email, state. And this, I believe, is a secret or something. Okay. So all the information that you had entered over here in application.properties is being used. Okay, you can see our uh, client secret ends with 0FF and client ID ends with CL2. Okay, so if you come over here, okay, this is CL2. Okay, you can see this up, up here over here and 0FF, I don't see 0FF anywhere, right? So if I search for 0FF, I don't see that. Okay, but but yeah, we are uh, seeing uh, the client ID up here over here. So this URL is being created by Spring Boot. Okay. And uh, this, these all information is being picked up from Spring, from application.properties that you have set. Okay, so what is happening is over here, our application sees that you have added OAuth starter, right? So starter project is a kind of project that has uh, pre-configured stuff, right? So you have added this starter, which means you wish to make use of OAuth2 at some point, right? And over here in security config, you have added this line where you're specifically mentioning that I want to make use of OAuth to login. And this is my success URL. So what happens is it picks up, it looks for all the properties, whether you have set up any sort of OAuth uh, client over here or OAuth configuration. Yes, you have. So what it does is it picks up this and it sends you to the requested URL or depending on whatever configuration you have set. So this entire thing is being taken care by Spring Boot because of this starter that you have added. So this starter is pre-configured stuff, right? And uh, this makes your life a lot easier as you can see, right? So this is the magic of Spring Boot auto configuration where you have literally not written a lot of code. You have just done some configuration. You've provided some values and all of these steps, okay? All of these steps are being taken care by Spring Boot in a right and secure way. You don't have to worry about any of these, right? Imagine writing code for all of this, right? It would have been messed. There would have been so much of errors and it would have been a complex process at the end. But this is so user-friendly for developers, right? So I hope you have some clarity as to what is happening with this flow and how 
uh, things are working in the hindsight, right? So I hope this was useful. So now it's time that we begin the setup for working or integrating Google with our application using OAuth2. So for that, we are going to need to set up the Google app. All right. And for that, I'm going to head over to Google Cloud Console over here, as you can see. So this is the Google Cloud Console link, which is the official link. If you search for Google Cloud Console, you're going to be taken or you're going to be shown this result console.cloud.google.com. So just head over here. And if you're logged into your Google account, you should be automatically taken to your dashboard. Okay, I'm logged into my Google account. Or otherwise, you would be asked to sign in. All right, but any Google account should work over here. Right. Now there is a concept of projects over here. Right. So in Google Cloud Console, you can create multiple projects. And you can have the respective settings within that particular projects specific to those projects, right? So here I have this project already created. Okay. Your interface might slightly differ if you don't have any sort of project, but at the top, you should see this option where you'll have this option to create a new project from scratch. So just select this project over here or select this option. I should say from here, right? And then you will have to enter the project name and select all the details. So I'll keep the project name as simple. I'll say OAuth2 application or app demo. Okay. So I'll say, say something like this. You can select the organization if you have it configured here on Google Cloud and you can hit create. Now it'll take some time for this to create over here. Okay. And uh, it's taking a bit over here, but the project should be ready. Okay. So the project is ready and you can say select the project. Okay. So I've switched to this project OAuth2 app demo. All right. And uh, you can see the dashboard. You can even switch to the project from here at the top. Right. Now this is a dashboard over here, the project dashboard you can see. And here you have multiple options for quick access. So you have options to access APIs and services. IAM and admin related stuff, the billing related stuff and so on. Since we want to enable the OAuth2 access and create an app for that, you can select API and services over here. Right. Now, once this loads over here, API and services, you'll see multiple options on the left hand side, like option for library credentials. So if you select credentials, here you will have an option to create credentials and create credentials, meaning you can create your client secret, the, uh, the client ID, client secret, and so on. All of that you will get from here, right? But first, before creating credentials, we need to set up the consent screen. Now, what is a consent screen? Consent screen is the screen that is shown to the user when he attempts to log in with Google. So over here, you can see there are some FAQs on the left hand side. Okay. This can be toggled. So if it's hidden for you, be sure to open this, but you can read a lot of FAQs over here. Okay. So when you make, so what is OAuth consent screen, right? You are here to set up that, right? So when you make use of OAuth2 for authorization, your application will request the authorization. Okay. From a Google account, right? And Google will display the consent screen to the user, right? So the consent screen would mean that do you as a user, wish to provide this application access to your Google account. Okay. And that is what you're setting up over here. Right. And there are things like what are scopes, all of this. Okay. You can go through if you wish to, but we'll set this up. Okay. So here, the first thing we are being asked over here is how do you want to configure and register your app? Right. What is the type of user you have? Right. So is it, in, is it you are configuring for internal or external? Now internal means this would only be available to users within your organization. So the organization that you have selected when creating this project, it will only be available to users within your organization. Okay. And if you're over on this, uh, we are not a, so this account is not a Google workspace user. All right. So this option is just disabled for me. I cannot select this. Okay. This is only available for Google workspace users. Okay. So this is for any sort of internal apps that you're building within the organization, right? And anyone external tries to access or log into the app using Google, he won't be allowed to, right? 
but we want external because we want any user with any Google account to log into our application. And here you need to make note of something. Our application will start in test mode. Test mode means it's not available to public, right? It's available only for test users. Who are the test users? Test users is a list of users that you configure here. Okay, I will, I'll show you in the steps we will be asked to configure the test users. Now, whoever you want to test the application, you can add that list over there and your application initially will be available only for those users, right? And not anyone else. Any other request from any other Google account will be straight away rejected, right? Then once your application is tested and it's ready to be published, you can move this to production. And at that time, it will go through a verification process by Google. And only then it will be available for all to access, right? So here we have external selected. I'll say create. And then you'll see on the left hand side, okay, so on the right hand side in the center, this thing, this is a form, right? You need to fill in the information. And the left hand side, you're being shown this nice image, which gives you an idea as to how the information that you're filling on the left hand side will appear to the user, right? So the first information that we are being asked over here is the app name. So I can just specify the app name as or to demo over here. Okay, which is absolutely fine. Support email will be my email, right? Uh, this is the dummy email, not my actual email, just letting you know. This is app logo. You can upload the logo over here. Okay, now logo and everything, the app name that you're using, everything comes here on this screen in this way. Okay, so Google will prompt that, do you want this app to access your Google account? Select what this app can access. Make sure you trust this app name. Okay, so make sure you have a familiar name that user knows, right? Don't add, don't add anything random over here if you're taking this to production, okay? And uh, if, you, if you add a name that user cannot identify or does not know, then there will be drop-offs. User won't give you the consent, right? Upload the logo. If you have a logo, the project logo or your company logo, be sure to upload that. It, it makes the screen look authentic. App domain, okay, application homepage. So you can mention the application homepage. So we don't have a front end yet, but uh, you can have the front end server URL over here. Okay, so whatever the front end URL is, you can add that over here. Okay, scroll down and uh, you have like authorized domain information and then you have email addresses. So I can say this is my email okay developer contact information this is again a dummy email that i've added all right so this page is filled okay now uh, now we need to move to the next stage so what i would do is i would come down over here okay and i'll say save and continue so everything is filled you can fill in the privacy policy link or application terms of service link you can add over here this is all this all things will be shown over here to the user so best you add a lot of information save and continue now the moment you save the next step is around scopes now what are scopes scopes means permissions that uh, you are requesting from users to authorize your application and based on these permissions you will be allowed to access specific information and data from their google account right so be sure to be very restrictive and limited over here a lot of permissions if you ask from the user he might deny it right so be sure to add scopes only that you need. So you can see the list of scopes over here. Okay. A lot of them, in fact, you can like keep scrolling through the list over here. Okay. 24 around of them. But I just want uh, things like basic information, like I need email, the profile information, and I'll select open ID. Okay. So that's what I'll select and I'll say update over here. So all those scope will be added over here. Okay. I don't have any sort of sensitive scopes or I don't want any sort of private data or restricted scopes that I want to add, right? Because this is all verified by Google, right? When you submit it for verification. I'll say save and continue. Okay, this is saved. And uh, now the next step is around test users. So remember, when, remember we discussed uh, in the beginning when we were beginning to setting up the consent screen that the application is initially published to test users and 
only the test users will be allowed to access the app initially. After you get your application verified and uh, after it moves to production, only then it's available for all. And as you can see over here, this is the screen where you load the test user information, right? Now the allowed cap is of 100, okay? And it's counted over the entire lifetime of the app, okay? So keep this in mind, 100 should be a very good number. I'll click on add users and I'll enter my own email over here, which is like the dummy email that I have for this course. Okay, so this is added. I don't have any more users that I wish to add as test users. I'll be testing with this account only. All right. So I'll say save and continue. Okay, but if you have more, you can add more. All right. And uh, yeah, this, this should work. So I'll just say save and continue. And then you have the summary screen over here. Okay, you can see the summary screen. So this is all the information that you've filled in, like your application homepage, support email, all of this, okay? Now here, after this is done, okay, this is entirely done, we can come to credentials. Once the OAuth consent screen is set up, we come over to credentials. You can click on create credentials, right? And I'll select OAuth client ID. Once I select this, Okay, I'm again being presented uh, with a form. Okay, so this is the first step. I'm being asked what sort of application I'm creating these credentials for. So the application is the web application, of course. Name of the application, I can like name this uh, or to client as uh, OAuth demo client, something like this. Okay. Then you'll be asked for uh, the origin of the request. So which origin, like from where the users will come in or from where the request will come in, not the users, okay? So I can add uh, over here, HTTP colon uh, local, or let me paste the URL. It's the front-end URL that I have, okay? I'll add the back-end also over here, okay? Something like this, all right? This is done. If you scroll down over here, you have an option to add authorized redirect URLs, right? So once the authentication is successful, where should the user be redirected or where should the request be redirected, right? So if you hover on this, you can see users will be redirected to this path after they have been authenticated with Google, okay? Now for GitHub, we had entered this as a callback URL, right? This was the callback URL. So normally this is what the callback URL is. This is a format, but instead of GitHub, you have Google over here. So like this, okay? So this is taken care by Spring Boot. You have localhost 8080. This is, of course, it has to be backend URL. You say login over to, this is code, and this is Google, okay? And this is where the uh, authorization code is posted by Google, all right? So this is done. I'll say create over here, okay? The moment I say create, I'm being presented with this pop-up, which tells me or which gives me a confirmation that the client ID or the client is created and it's showing me the list of, uh, sorry, not the list, the list of details. Okay, over here, client ID, client secret, the date when it was created and status. So I would encourage you all to save this at a secure place or you can even download this information as JSON. Okay, so totally up to you. But this information will need to configure our Spring Boot application and our application will be utilizing this information to enable the OAuth integration or to integration, I should say, with Google. All right. So I hope this was useful and I hope you have been able to follow along well. All right. So now it's time that we move to the next stage and we get our application configured to work with uh, Google credentials or the Google client ID and client secret. All right, so what I'm going to do is we are going to need these properties to set up the client ID and client secret for Google. So I'm going to paste this as is, okay? And I'm going to add Google over here and I'll do some minor changes. Instead of GitHub, this will be Google. And instead of GitHub over here also, it will be Google, okay? I'll get rid of these keys over here, the IDs and the secret, okay? Now we need to add the IDs and secrets that we have created over here on the dashboard, right? So I'll copy the client ID. I'll paste it over here quickly. 
I'll come over here back and I'll copy the client secret and I'll paste it over here. Okay. We don't need to add scopes over here like we did add for GitHub because scope is something that we configured for Google on the dashboard itself. Like the dashboard, there only we configured the scope. So our application is configured right now for the scope that we have entered over there. Right. So that, uh, so these credentials will only work for those scope is what I mean to say. All right. So one more thing, just don't try to make use of any of my credentials. I'm straight away going to delete this once I'm done recording this course. All right. So this is done and I believe our application is ready to be tested for Google and GitHub both. Uh, in fact, GitHub is already working fine, should be working fine. And Google, it's, it's ready to be tested. We don't need to make any other changes because rest all changes like adding the startup project. Okay, that is done. We have the configuration also set up and enabled to, to tell Spring Boot or Spring Security that, hey, we need to make use of OAuth to login and we want this as the success URL, right? So that is also done. So, so yeah, this is all done from our end and we are ready to test it. So now it's time that we get our application to testing. And once we have everything set up, I'll restart the application so that we have the fresh new changes loaded onto our local server. You can see the application is up and running. I'll come over here. Okay, and uh, this was our application previously. So I'll just clear some cookies if there are any. Okay, I'll reload. And the moment you refresh, you'll see this page appear. Okay, you can see login with OAuth2. And you're seeing two options, GitHub and Google. So early on when we did not have Google configured, okay, we were directly being redirected to the page of GitHub, like this page over here. Okay. Oops. I straight away got in. All right. Because I've given the access over there. Okay. But uh, if I refresh, uh, let me like, okay. Uh, one second. Let me clear the cookies again. Probably there is some issue. Yeah, now we have here. So if you click on GitHub, you'll be taken to the GitHub page, okay, for authorization and authentication purposes. But early on, we were not seeing this page, but instead, when we did not have Google configured, we were straight away being taken to the GitHub page. But now there are two options, right? And we are telling the application, okay, we are telling Spring Boot that, hey, uh, we need to make use of OAuth login. And uh, what Spring Boot does is it takes a look at the application properties. You have everything configured over here. Okay. And it sees that there is Google as well as GitHub. There are two options. So I don't know which option user might want to go ahead with. So it creates this page and it showcases this to user with two options here, GitHub and Google. Now you as a user can select which option you wish to choose. If you wish to choose Google, you can select over here. Okay. It's asking me for my email and you can see over here, this is the login page and this is the name of the application. If you click on this, okay, you will see the developer info. Like this is the email associated and uh, signing in will redirect you to this page over here. Okay. So this is, this all information you had entered on that dashboard. Like this is the uh, page where I'll be redirected and so on. Right. So I'll enter my email and my password and we'll see the next step. Now, the moment you enter your credentials, you will be shown this authorization page over here. Okay, so it's it's telling me or to demo. This is the app, app name wants additional access to your Google account. Okay, so if you come over here, not here uh, on Google Cloud. Okay, I was locked out. But if you come over here on the consent screen, okay, let me come to the consent screen. So you can see this is the consent screen app name or to demo, right? And this is what you're seeing over here, right? And uh, here you can see, make sure you trust this app and all of this. So all of this was being shown to you over here. Okay, on, uh, so when you went to edit over here, you were shown this, all this information, like this is how your information is going to be used, right? And that is how indeed it's being used. Okay, you can see the services to which your uh, this app will have access to. So it will get your personal information, your profile information and your email address. Okay. 
So user has complete transparency here from the Google's end. And when he says continue, okay, he's logged in and he is being taken to this default URL. How did this work? So this worked because of this line over here. Okay, the default success URL that we have added over here. Okay, so I hope uh, this is clear now. And uh, just to give you a gist of this entire flow, okay, this flow was similar to that of uh, GitHub. Here, it started from like the step four where we were redirected to Spring Boot, where we tried to access Spring Boot and OAuth login page was shown. And after entering the authorization, like after giving in the login, authorization information, and after our credentials were validated, we were redirected to the Spring Boot backend with the auth code. Then Spring Boot exchanged this code for access token, and then it fetched the user information using the token and it received the user information and it redirected the user to the success page. All right. So this entire thing worked in the fraction of second. And how many lines of code did we write? <laughs> Very less. Okay. We, we just did the configuration stuff and rest. Everything was taken care by Spring Boot and this starter that we have added over here, this starter, right? The benefit of using starter is it comes with a lot of pre-configured or pre-written stuff. You have to just include it over here and it just does the job. And we have three starters, in fact, over here. Okay, so Spring Boot starters are amazing. You can imagine like uh, you can imagine like writing code for all of this, all of these steps, right? It would have been crazy, right? Uh, but yeah, Spring Boot makes it easy for you. For Google, actually, we did literally nothing. We just configured these two parameters or these two properties, I should say. And we were done, right? So yeah, that's the magic of uh, Spring Boot for you. Test it out. These both the login options should work perfectly fine for you if you have followed these steps correctly. So I hope this was useful and uh, I hope uh, you all enjoyed this. Hey there, welcome and let us begin talking about React. So we'll talk about what is React, why such a thing exists, okay? So here I'm on Google and I'm going to simply type in React. So the moment you type in React, you're going to be presented with this official website of React, which is react.dev. Now, before visiting the website, let me talk a little bit about what React is. So React is a library, as you can see over here in the description, and it is a JavaScript library. So if you are a little bit familiar of web development or if you are a computer engineer, you will know that web essentially consists of HTML, then we have CSS and we even have JavaScript. Now what is HTML? HTML is nothing but the building block of the web. So if you right click on anything over here, like any element, these are all elements, right? So if you right click on any of the elements, if you say inspect, so I'm on Chrome, and I have this option inspect and let me like take this down. So you are going to see all the code over here and you can see all the HTML elements here. If you hover on any of the element, you're going to see the corresponding HTML element being highlighted. Okay. This is a div. So HTML essentially consists of tags. Like you can see over here, div tag, then we have h2 tag. These are all inbuilt HTML tags that browsers understand. So these are modern browsers that understand these things. Okay, so this is HTML. What is HTML used for? It is used to define the elements. Now what happens is defining the elements is not enough. Okay, you need to beautify them. For example, like here you see this react is being highlighted in bold, right? Why is it being highlighted in bold? Because I've searched for react. Okay, there is a particular styling for this, right? You can see this is being highlighted like in light gray, which is a little bit different from this thing over here. This is a link, right? So this is being highlighted differently. So if I right click over here and if I inspect, you'll see this is H3, okay, and A tag. Here you can see A tag. So in HTML, you create links using the A tag. Now if you like expand this a bit, here is where you will see all the CSS, you can see. So A tag, this is the A tag. And here you can see the CSS, the color is defined as blue. Now if I change the color to, let's say, pink, red, you'll see the color is being changed in the browser. You can see this is completely real time. If I want to change this to, let's say yellow, which color do you want? Okay. 
So you can change the color. So this is how beautification is being added to web pages. Okay. So you can see like beautification is being controlled by CSS. What this code is, you can see over here, this code is CSS. So you're saying for a tag. Now what is a tag? A tag is over here, which is, so if I hover on a tag, you'll see the corresponding tag being highlighted or the corresponding element being highlighted on the left. Okay. When you hover on the tag. So it's the react, this react text. Okay. That is what it is. And here you have CSS for the same. So a tag, it says all the a tags. So if I hover on a tag, you'll see all the a tags being highlighted on the left hand side, right? So that is where all the a tags are being used, which means that is where all the links are being rendered because these are all links, right? So I want all the a tags to be in this color. I don't want any sort of text decoration. That is what you're defining over here. Okay. Cursor is being changed to pointer. So if I hover on this, you can see the cursor is being changed, right? It's being changed to a pointer. I can disable that. Okay. Okay. It's not allowing me to override that, but that's fine. So the point is to understand what CSS is. You can see that live over here, right? So I'll try to bring it to the default color. It was something like this. Okay. Yellow and green is not looking that natural, but you understand like this is CSS, right? Then you have something called as JavaScript. Now, what is JavaScript? JavaScript brings in life to the web pages. So any sort of validation you want to do in the web pages, any kind of pop-up you want to show, you can do all of that. Okay. So if you want to see JavaScript in action, we can go to console tab over here at the top. Okay. And this is the browser console. So here I can say alert. Okay. And I can simply say hi here. Something like this. Okay. You can see hi. This is the alert. So any sort of validations, pop-ups or any sort of uh, dynamic things you want to do, you can make use of uh, JavaScript. Okay. So JavaScript adds life to your web pages. Okay. Now what is React? React is a JavaScript library. Okay. Let us head over to the website of uh, React and let us understand why this thing exists. Okay. Now let us understand how web used to work before react. Okay. So what used to happen is this is a web page, right? And uh, you have different interactive elements over here. So I can click on the nav bar and I can go to another page. Now, when you load a web page, HTML is loaded, CSS is loaded, JavaScript is loaded. Now, when you switch over to another tab over here, again, the entire thing is reloaded. So HTML is reloaded. CSS is reloaded and JavaScript is reloaded. If I go over here, again, everything is reloaded. Click on community again, everything is reloaded. So this is not efficient, you know, like every time, even though CSS and JavaScript does not change and it's constant throughout the side, we are reloading it. Okay. And this is not good, right? This is not the efficient way. And uh, we humans love to be efficient, right? And that is why react exists. So I'll tell you how React is different. So React is used to make single page web applications. Now, what does it mean? So what happens is you have this web application. This is a web application, right? This is a web page. It's a web application. It is going to have a frame outside. This is a frame. And inside, for example, it is going to have components. So for example, search is a component. These tabs are, is a nav bar component. Okay, you can create a nav bar and you can add like four buttons over there. Okay, this button is also a component. This is also a component. Then the center part is also a component. So this entire page has a frame and within this frame, you have components inside placed. Okay, now what happens is if you want to switch over to learn over here, you can see the top thing does not change across the website, right? So why do you want to reload this? You don't want to reload this. You can just reload this bottom part, right? So with the help of this component based architecture, this became possible. So instead of reloading this entire web page, even though navbar is constant, you are reloading that entire thing, right? It is not efficient, right? It is consuming uh, your data. It is consuming network activity. It is also consuming processing power. It is not efficient. So that is why this component based uh, thing came into picture where only the component where there was a change used to be reloaded. So if you go to reference, only this part will be reloaded. 
if I switch to this, only this part will be reloaded. So that is what is a single page application. So it is actually single page application, like one page and the components are being reloaded. Okay. And they are being reloaded depending on where you are interacting and how the application is built. Okay. So that is what single page web applications are and react is used to make these kind of single page web applications. Okay. So what reacts allow you to do is here you can see it allows you to create components. Okay. Now, like I said here, this thing is a component. This thing is a component. All these things can be components that you have defined and then you can have a frame and within this frame, you can load all the components. That is what react allows you to do. Okay. And why does it allow you to do? So I just explained because if you like go to reference, I'm just reloading this bottom part. I'm not reloading this nav bar. I'm not reloading this message at the top, right? Only this bottom part is being reloaded. If I click over here, only the things on the right side is being reloaded. You don't need to reload the entire web page every time, right? So that is what react allows you to do. It allows you to create components. You can create components. Okay. So for example, you can create search bar using react. You can create nav bar using react, and then you can define a frame and within that frame, you can assemble all the components in whichever way you like. Okay. So that is what this thing talks about. Okay. So it lets you build user interfaces out of individual pieces called components. And it also has an amazing demo here on the website. Okay. So this website might change the interface might change depending on when you're watching this video. But right now I'm seeing this kind of an interface on the website. Okay. If you come over here, they have this amazing example. So don't worry if you don't understand this code. Okay. What this thing is trying to highlight over here is there are components in here. You can see this is an interface. Okay. Our interface that you want to show. This is a video thumbnail. Then you have the video title, description, like button and so on. Okay. Now here, what you have done is you have created a component called thumbnail. So you can see over here thumbnail, right? Then you have created a component called like button here, like button. You have a component called video. Okay. You can see, so this is the entire component video you can see, right? So this is reusable as you can imagine. Okay. So like button, if I want to use at some other place, I need to just make use of this tag. Okay. Thumbnail. I need to use at another place. I can just make use of this tag. Okay. And tomorrow, if there is any change in the thumbnail, I just need to make that change at one place and it's reflected across the app. Tomorrow, if I want to change how the animation of uh, this like button works or any sort of UI change over here, I want to change the color of like button. You just make change wherever you have defined this like button. So wherever you have defined this like button, you make that small change and you save it. It's deployed across the app. That's the magic. So reusability, as you can imagine, is one of the major things that is coming across. You can see over here. Okay. You can see whether you work on your own or thousands of other developers using react feels the same. Okay. It allows you to seamlessly combine components written by independent people. Okay. And here you can see this is amazing. You can see here. So using a little bit of JavaScript, it has rendered. So you created a video over here. Okay. Uh, this was a video that you created and using JavaScript, you are rendering video three times. You can see three videos. Okay. And this syntax, this is a markup syntax that is known as JSX. So JSX is something that you will hear often when you're working with uh, react. Okay. So this is about uh, react and how it works. Okay. So I would encourage you all to just go through this website. Also to give you one more example, a little bit interactive one, I, we can go to learn over here. And if I scroll down here, you can see this. Okay. So here, what we have done is essentially we have created a function. So this is a function that is returning button. And let's say this can be any button. So right now it's a very simple button and it says I'm a button. Okay. But let's say if you need a sort of button that is specific in UI and message to your application, you can define it like this. And here, what you have done is here, I'm like rendering this button over here. You can see my button. 
So I'll tell you what happens is when you're developing with HTML, you have like inbuilt tags. You have this H1 tag, you have H2 tag, you have H3 tag. And every tag has a meaning, right? H1 tag has a meaning. Like if you write anything using H1 tag, it is going to be shown in this way in header. If I replace this and this is like a proper editor, so I can, I'm allowed to change the code over here. So if I change this to H2, like so, you can see this will like show things in a different way. Okay. The font size is little bit smaller. Okay. So every tag that is inbuilt in HTML has its own meaning. So here you can see this is our own custom tag. So react allows you to create your own custom tag here. We have defined our own custom tag, my button. This is the function, my button that we have defined. What is the definition of my button? This is the definition. So whenever you are calling my button, we are calling my button. We are using my button over here. Whenever you are using my button over here, this is returned and this is replaced over here in a way. Okay. So this thing, this entire thing, is being replaced over here like this when this is rendered into the browser okay so i'll just do control z i can even prove it to you so if i right click over here and say inspect let us see over here what's happening okay so i'll just take this down a bit I'll scroll towards right you can see here you are not seeing my button so here actually we are writing my button in the code but here you are not seeing my button here you are seeing this code being rendered you can see so what is happening is wherever you are using my button during runtime, this is going to get rendered. The definition of my button is going to be get rendered. So let me replicate this. So I'll replicate this and you can see one more button was added. Okay. Now if I change the definition, I am a, let me say I'm awesome button. You can see it's reflected everywhere. Can you imagine this magic? Like, so one you change at one thing. You change at one place. I'm sorry. You change at one place and it is reflected across the application. So if you have any sorts of custom buttons, custom likes, imagine building Instagram. You're using like button at several places, right? And you have that uh, theme to maintain. So you create a component. Okay. You use it at several places, thousand places you use. You need to make a change to the component. No problem. You come and make a change over here and it is reflected across the application. Okay. So this is what, and you can make use of this component n number of times. So I can like just keep on rendering this and you will see, you can see the definition being substituted over here. So this is the benefit of react. So like we understood this react promotes the usage of single page applications. Okay. You can make single page web applications. You can uh, essentially create your own components. You can reuse those components. So it promotes reusability. You can, uh, it allows you to maintain your code easily as well. So if you want to make a change, you make change at one place, it's reflected across. So it makes, it keeps things tidy. Okay. Also React is very popular these days. So if you search for React salary in your location, wherever you are from, you can see, so this is, payscale.com for United States. And you can see, uh, this is the salary right now that is getting paid for to react developers, even full stack developer are being paid well. So there are a lot of jobs that demand this skill set, And it's important that you learn this as a software engineer. So whether you are a backend engineer, whoever you are these days, react is also being used to create mobile applications. Okay. So yeah, it's really important that you understand this stuff and start building stuff using this technology. So this is react. Now, how do we write code in react? So to write code in react, you need node.js. Now, what is node.js? So node.js is nothing but a JavaScript runtime and it lets you execute JavaScript code on the server side. Okay, so that's something that we'll need node.js. We'll also need something called as NPM. Now, what is NPM? So NPM is nothing but a package manager for JavaScript. Okay, it is used to manage the different packages that you use with JavaScript. Uh, like you can, it is used to install libraries, tools, frameworks. So if you want to make use of React, you need to make use of this package manager. Okay, also 
we will need something called as visual studio code so this is going to be the ide okay and uh, we are going to make use of this and and it has a wonderful support for web development as well so we are going to make use of visual studio code for this so coming to our browser what we are going to do is we are going to head over to google and we are going to search for node js okay this is something that we are going to need i'm going to click on this and you can see over here this is where we will need to install the node js so you can download the node js lds version okay you can download it from here and you can even go to download page and if you need anything custom like for windows mac you can get the selection from here okay installation process is very straightforward you download this like any normal software program and you just follow the setup and installation instructions okay once you have downloaded what you can do is you can come over to your terminal and you can verify whether the installation was successful so you can say node hyphen v you should see this version being printed so your version number might be a little different from that of mine because uh, this this might depend on when you're watching this video and whether there is a newer version available but don't worry about a different version number a number should get printed that is what you should worry about then you type in npm so we need this node package manager as well okay and you can say hyphen v so this should also print a version number it's okay if it's different than that of mine okay but we need these two things to be installed on your system so one is node.js which is the javascript runtime okay and then we have npm which is a package manager so just be sure that you have both of this so now is the time that we begin to set up our react application all right and uh, what we need to do is we need to navigate to the folder of our choice where we need to create the react application so i've re i have navigated to this folder this is where i wish to create the application and to navigate you can make use of cd space and you can enter the uh, the folder okay where you want to navigate all right uh, but i've already navigated and we are going to run a command over here so i'm going to say over here npx i'm going to say create react app okay and here then i'm going to specify the app name all right now what is this npx create react app now this is a command that is used to quickly set up a new react application with a very standard project structure and configuration and react is a very popular javascript library like you know for building user interfaces so npx out of this is a tool so this part comes with node.js okay npx and uh, node.js is something that you have installed on your system and it stands for node package runner okay and uh, you can execute packages directly from the npm registry as well so here uh, this part of the command is a package that sets up the new react project okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to add my project name over here so i can say react app over here something like this okay and uh, i'll press enter now the moment you press enter uh, or before pressing enter be sure that you have everything in small case okay don't write capital letters here or you might get an error but when you when i type in this and when i press enter you will see a sort of processing that will happen and it will give you what all it's trying to do so it's installing packages and this will take some time okay and uh, you can see this will take some time depending on the kind of processing power and the internet connection speed that you have so wait for a while okay so the processing is done and our application is finished creating okay so if you scroll up over here you will see a summary where it started installing packages over here okay it did some processing it added these many packages okay and uh, if you scroll down it uh, has shown you this success message over here okay and in the end it has given you few tips so this is a command that you can make use of to start the development server that's cool our application comes with an inbuilt development server right 
uh, it also gives you this command called npm run build which will bundle the app into static files for production so if you're deploying this application to production you need to run this command to prepare it for production this is used to run test cases okay this is another command so yeah these are the tips all right and if you scroll down it has also given you some suggestion okay it has given you suggestion that you type in this command you navigate so using this command you will navigate to the project actually right and then you can run this so i'll copy this and i'll paste it over here and i'll press enter so we are inside the project now and i'll copy this command npm start okay and i'll press enter over here now npm start will start the development server for us and uh, we will be able to access the application into the browser so you can see over here this is the application that we created or i should rather say we did not create okay we used uh, create react app command to get this created and we have this boilerplate setup right now you can see this is the startup page over here for all the newly created react apps and here it's giving you a tip that you need to edit uh, app.js under src folder and if you just save it it auto reloads right and yes this is a logo and then you have this link over here if you click on this link it takes you to the official website of react all right and this is a react logo that you see here okay so yeah that's the application setup and we have our application up and running all right but right now we have it uh, on via the terminal like the local terminal that we have on our system all right uh, we will soon move this to the ide So now it's time that we move our development of front end to Visual Studio Code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to head over to the browser and I'm going to search for Visual Studio Code over here. And you'll see this link code.visualstudio.com. So just head over to this website here and this is the IDE that we are going to need. So if you have this IDE already installed well and good, Otherwise, I would encourage you all to download this. So you can download this for Windows. I'm right now on Windows, so I'm seeing this download for Windows button. But this is also available for other platforms like Mac or Linux. All right. And this is what the IDE looks like. All right. So you can see you can code in any language over here. You can add extensions. OK, you have GitHub Copilot integration over here. And uh, yeah, a lot of stuff you can go through this uh, website over here. All right. It is one of the most popular IDs when it comes to web development. And if you have, if you are an engineer, it's very unlikely that you have not heard of uh, Visual Studio Code. So I already have this installed onto my system and you'll see a few recent projects over here because I make use of this a lot. Okay. So what I need to do now is I have Visual Studio Code open. I need to open the project. So you need to go to file. You need to say open folder and you need to navigate to the folder where you have created the project and that will open up over here. So I do have the project open now. OK, I'll close this welcome screen. All right. And you can see this entire project, uh, like all the files have been loaded into this ID over here. OK. And what you can do is you can come over here at the top. OK, so right now I'll tell you we are making use of this terminal, right? This is an external terminal uh, using which we are running our React application. Now, of course, you can like code over here and you can come over here and see or you can do command line related tasks over here. But what we would do is we would migrate to a IDE experience over here. So everything that we do around the project should be from the IDE. So I'll go over here, I'll go to terminal, I'll say new terminal. So Visual Studio Code has its inbuilt terminal. Okay, you can even create multiple terminals from here. Okay, so these are two terminals open now and I can switch between them. Okay, now over here you can run terminal commands just like you are running in actual terminal. So you can say pwd, it gives you like the directory in which you are. This will clear the screen, okay. And uh, from here, you can even start the server. So if you say npm start, I need to stop this server first. OK, so I'll say command C or control C. OK, this will terminate the server. And from here, if I say npm start, OK, then this will start the server right from within the IDE. 
All right, you can see it started the server right from here. Okay, and you have the application now running from the terminal. So to hide this, you can simply like collapse this this way, drag it down and it will go away, right? And you can get it from here. There's a shortcut as well that you can remember, all right? So yeah, this is about uh, the Visual Studio Code experience and uh, integrating it into React development. So I would encourage you all to set this up for yourself as well and get started with the next steps. Now over here you are seeing, let me zoom in a bit, okay. You are seeing this project structure that was automatically created with the help of create react app, okay. So let us go through this project structure, okay. So here this is the folder or the project name that I had specified when uh, mentioning the project name or when running the command. Then you have node modules, okay. So what are node modules? So this directory contains all the npm packages, which means libraries, dependencies that your project relies on. Okay. So generally you won't need to interact with this folder directly. Okay. So you won't be touching this folder at all. Then you have public folder. Now public folder has all the static files like uh, main index.html. Uh, you can see like the name itself public. So all the static files, favicon, all of that will come over here. Okay, then you have like index.html over here. Okay, this will contain the root div element which the your application will interact. Okay, uh, if you close this, you have uh, let me close this. Okay, then you have uh, over here some JSON files. Okay, or let us talk about SRC. So SRC is a very important folder for you as a developer because this is where you will be writing all your code and this is where all the magic will happens okay so this will have all your javascript files all your react components style sheets images any other assets that you are working on everything will reside over here okay now within src if you take a look at uh, app.js okay so if you come over to the browser you can see edit src slash app.js so this page is being rendered from here okay so if you see over here edit src app.js so that message is coming in from here okay and then at the bottom you had a link which said that if you need to learn react you need to go to this link so that is where this is coming from okay this is where it's coming from okay so this is app.js then you have index.js what is index.js okay this is a starting point of the react app and this is where this app component is being rendered okay so you understand this app.js is a component that is being added in index.js you can see this is being added over here okay so all your source code will reside don't worry if you are not understanding anything right now about what component is going where but what I mean to say essentially over here is all your source code will reside over here. Okay. And uh, whatever changes you need to make, you can make over here. Okay. So SRC is the folder where you will be working a lot because you as a dev, you will be building stuff and SRC will be your home. So right now, what I would encourage you all to do is here in the app.js. Since you're seeing this message coming in, you can modify this message and play around with the HTML a bit. And so instead of edit, if I say edit one, and if I save this file, if you come over here, you can see edit one being reflected. We have not done any sort of refresh, reload, anything, right? How is this being reflected? I just changed here and I just saved it. And we have a server running. How and where the server come from? So remember, we like started the server by saying npm start over here. So this was the command that we executed, npm start. And this triggered the development server. You can see, you can read these, uh, these output over here, okay, this thing over here that you see. Compiled successfully, and it also gave you a URL. So if you are accessing on local, this is the one. If you're accessing on network, this is the one, okay? So you have a server which is up and running. It is hosting your application. And whatever changes you're making over here, you just need to save the file. So I edited this file. You see this 
dot over here at the top which it means that it's not saved so if without saving if you check it won't reflect okay if you save this control s come here it is reflecting auto reload so i would encourage you all to make change and uh, observe what's happening it's good to get familiar with the playground All right, so now it's time that uh, we begin working on our application. So here the application is running in the browser. And what I would do straight away over here is I would come over to app.js, all right. And here, uh, this is uh, what we are returning, right? So I don't want to return this entire thing within the diff, right? So I'll just get rid of this. This is the boilerplate that we have, all right. And if you come over here, Okay, if I save this, and if you come over here, it turns into white screen, all right? So yes, everything is done. Okay, and now from here, we can start uh, creating things that we need for our application. So what I would do is I need a component, first of all, called home, right? And when the user visits home, he is able to see two options to log in, which is Google and GitHub. You can add more if you wish to, but we'll start with two. And uh, we'll have one more component, which is the dashboard. Okay, so after the user is authenticated, he's redirected to dashboard, all right? That is what we are going to do. So I would create a new file over here. I would call it home.js, okay? This is the file and uh, let's organize this. So I'll have a folder called components here, something like this, and I'll move this home.js inside this folder right now within home.js we'll start uh, defining the things that we need on home so first thing i'll import react at the top okay i'll say import react and i'll this gets auto populated import react from react over here all right and uh, here i'll say const home okay so this is the component definition that i'm having over here okay and uh, yeah from here i'll start uh, writing in the definition all right so the first thing we need is uh, we need functions so we will be having two functions defined one to handle the google login and one to handle the github login okay and uh, on the ui so let me also uh, showcase how ui is going to come out all right so here i'm going to say return okay so first i'll have a return over here and I'll give you an idea of uh, how uh, the UI will look. And on the basis of that, you are going to get a better clarity as to what we need over here. Okay, so I'm going to say div over here. All right. And uh, here I can say button. Okay. And uh, yeah, this will be button. And here at the top, I can have a h2 tag, something like this. I can say, welcome to the OAuth demo, something like this. Okay. Now this button is going to say over here, login. Oops, so I'm going to say login with Google, something like this, okay? And uh, I'm going to have an on-click event because when the user clicks on this, we need to take him somewhere, right? So I'm going to say on-click and uh, here I, I can have a definition to function, okay? So I can map this to a function, all right? So let me hide this so you can see this. This is the button, right? So this is Google login, okay? And uh, if you replicate this, this can same be used for GitHub as well. Okay, something like this. Okay, and uh, this part, instead of GitHub, it will be something like this, okay? Uh, this is how the UI is going to look like, okay? Now, if I save this, okay? And let me also add this over here. Okay, so I want to show the component, right? I have not added it yet. Okay, let me show you what happens if I don't add. So if I don't add the component into app.js, you don't see anything on the home page, right? So if I add this onto uh, over here, okay, so it, it's not coming in. So I'll go and import this. So I'll say import, I'll say home from, and uh, I'll say slash components slash home over here. Okay, and now we can make use of this home over here. Okay, 
something like this. Yep. So yeah, now if I save this and if you come over here, okay, uh, it was not found as the module has no exports. All right, sorry about this. So here, if you come, you also need to, so after input, after uh, defining this, you also need to export this. All right, now how are you going to export this? So over here in the end, you're going to say export default and you're going to say home over here. Okay, only then it appears over here and you can make use of it. All right, now here, okay. So it's, it's throwing us an error that Google login and GitHub login is not defined, which is okay. I'm just going to close this. Okay, uh, so we need to define them as well. So I'll come over here, okay. And uh, at the top over here, you can see const Google login and uh, th these can be functions over here. Okay. So I'll say something like this and uh, and yeah, this is one definition. I can have the similar one for GitHub as well. Okay. GitHub. Okay. Now let me see. So you can see over here. The UI has appeared. You can see login with Google and login with GitHub. Right now, if you click on these, nothing happens. Okay. So what is happening over here is we start by importing React. Okay. And then over here, what we are doing is we are returning this JSX, right? So this is the interface that we are returning. And you can see over here, this is wrapped into div, which is a parent div. You have H2 and two buttons to enable login with Google and GitHub, right? Now over here, these two buttons are mapped to these functions that I have defined. These functions definitions are empty. There's nothing there. Okay. But uh, we need to add some code. What, what should happen if user clicks on Google login, right? So that is what we are going to define here, right? And if you come here, you can see uh, the interface up here, right? Now this interface is appearing because we have added this into app.js. Okay. Over here. Now, what I'll do is over here, I should redirect the user to backend. Okay. So where do we redirect? So I'm going to redirect him to a URL. So I'm going to say localhost colon 8080. And you can see this URL over here, localhost colon 8080, uh, this uh, auth2 slash authorization slash GitHub, right? So this is a URL that I'm going to copy. And this is where we are going to redirect the user to. So if you click on this URL over here, okay, you should be taken to the login for OAuth2 using GitHub. Okay. Now for some reason, this is not working because my backend server is not up. Okay. So once your backend server is up, let me turn on my backend server. And then now if you come over here and if you say refresh, this should ideally take you to the login page of GitHub. So you are clearly into that OAuth flow, right? So I had copied the URL, I'll come over here. And uh, what I would do is I would say window dot location, okay, dot href. Now I'm doing redirect like this, okay, and I'll paste this, okay. So this is for GitHub, be sure to change this for Google over here. For Google, the URL is same, almost. I'll just copy this over here, and I'll paste it over here, like this, okay. And uh, I'll switch this from Google to GitHub because this is for GitHub, something like this, okay? Now, if you save this, be sure to save. And if you come over here, if you click on login with Google, you're being taken to the sign-in page. You can see this is your application. And if you do back, okay, Google login is not defined, seriously. <laughs> and if, I, if you click uh, login with GitHub, you'll see this page up here, okay? So, so yeah, this is uh, what we have done with the home page. All right. So we have home page created and uh, yeah, we need to move forward with the application. So right now on home page, we just have a couple of things. We have three elements, header and two buttons, pretty simple, right? And uh, you have a couple of functions that do the redirects. Okay. Now what happens is as soon as you click on a button, the location, like you can see window.location.href, this attribute is changed and you're being redirected to this URL that you've mentioned, okay? And depending on which button you're clicking, the appropriate function is being triggered and you are being redirected, all right? So that's about the home component. I hope you have been able to follow along so far.
So now since we have our application set up, like the homepage set up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually try out logging in and logging in with GitHub or Google, okay? So I'll click on Google. I'm shown this page. I'll select an account, whichever account you want to sign in with. Okay, it's asking me to verify, okay? I have two-factor authentication enabled for this one. So I'm going to enter my two-factor credentials for my Google account. And uh, then you can see uh, I'm being asked for authorization. I'll say continue. And now you'll see I'm being redirected to this success URL. Now this success URL is off backend, right? That's a problem. So normally what happens is this should come to front end. So you should have localhost colon 3000 because that is where our application is running, right? This is where our application is running. So we should ideally be redirected to some URL over here, something like dashboard over here, right? So this should be the URL, right? So what I would do is I would copy this entire uh, thing over here. And uh, actually what we can do is we can add uh, this thing as a success URL. Okay, we can replace the URL that we have. So here I'll come and I'll replace the URL with this one, okay? And I'm going to restart the server, okay? Now there is another problem or one more problem I should say, okay? We updated the URL over here, right? From the backend URL to the frontend URL. But the thing is, if you go to that URL over here, okay? So these are URL that we have added in the backend. What happens is just the homepage is shown, right? So there is no component that is linked to this URL, all right? So what we need to do is we need to link a component to URL and we are going to make use of routes, React routes, right? And uh, this is a concept using which uh, if you have an application where you have multiple components, okay? Now, every component could be a component that is to be displayed on a particular path in the application. Now, for this thing over here, slash dashboard is the path. So on this, probably I might want to load the dashboard component. Right, so that mapping of the URL to the to that of the component is being done with the help of routes. So what I would do is I would come over here, okay, and here in app.js, I would do a little bit of restructuring, right? So for example, I would just comment this out first, okay, and uh, here I'm going to say router, okay? So we first need to import a router, okay? Uh, so I'm going to say at the top over here, import, I'm going to say browser router. Okay. So I'm not seeing auto suggest over here. So what I would do is I would actually go to terminal. Okay. Or let me also go to package.json. Okay. So I, I don't think I have the package installed for react router DOM. Okay. So I don't have, so what I would do is I would say npm install react and this is within the project directory. Okay, something like this. So what would happen is react router dom would be installed and you can see uh, package.json was updated with this dependency. So package.json is a place where you have a list of dependencies, you can see. So if you want to see any package exist in your application, you can check this file, right? So react router dom was just updated uh, into this uh, file, I'll just close this. So now we have uh, React Router DOM, all right. So what I would do is I would make use of uh, browser router. Okay, you can see the suggestion, all right. And uh, I would import this as router. I would import this as route and uh, routes, something like this, okay. So this is done, okay. And what I would do is I would say router over here, okay. And within this, I'll say routes, something like this, okay? And within this, I'm going to define the route, okay? Like this, all right? Now, here, I'm going to have the mapping, okay? So I'm going to say path. So for this path, so for the home page, okay? I need to have this element, which element should come in, okay? The element that should come in is home over here, right? So I'm going to say, home something like this okay so so yeah this is done over here and uh, i don't need a closing tag over here so i can just close it this way and get rid of this okay so so yeah this is our definition for this route if i save this and if i come here okay uh, let me go to 
Oh, okay, let me have this also open this URL. I'll open a new tab and I'll go to home page. Okay, so you see this up here. All right. And uh, what I can do is I'll duplicate this. Okay. And over here, I can have slash dashboard over here. Okay. And here I can have dashboard defined okay but dashboard does not exist right now so what i can do is i can create a new component called dashboard.js over here okay and uh, yeah uh, we could add an import over here as well okay so i'll just duplicate this i'll say dashboard and uh, from components slash dashboard something like this okay so this is there and uh, within dashboard what we can do is we can have uh, we can have the definition all right so i can say import react over here okay and uh, oops so like this and i can say constant dashboard okay and uh, have a component defined okay so this will be my component which is going to return over here okay and what it's going to return it will, will keep things simple for now okay i i will have this closing okay and i'm going to add the export export default dashboard okay something like this and here i can uh, simply return Let's see yeah, if we can return H2 and I'll see. Hello. All right. Now let us see what happens if you refresh this. Okay. You can see hello appear over here on slash dashboard URL. All right. Now, if you go to react app. Okay. So this was the redirect URL earlier after you did a OAuth login, you were redirected over here. Okay. Now let me log in, but before logging in, be sure that after making the change in the URL on the backend, you have actually restarted the server. So I have not, so I'll restart the server. Okay. So that the new URL or the new redirect URL is actually reflected. Okay. So the application is running. Okay. We have this new URL being reflected. Okay. And uh, what I would do is here, I would hit refresh and I'll just say login with Google. Now you can see. After logging in, I have been redirected to the dashboard page. Okay, so this is working absolutely fine. I can do back over here. I can come over here. So the backend URL, the backend structure is not exposed to the front end, right? I can do the same with GitHub as well. On successful uh, login, I'm being, I will be redirected to the dashboard page. All right. So I hope uh, you have this clarity as to how you can make use of routes to basically map the URLs with that of the components. So now it's time that we built up the dashboard over here. So once the user logs in with Google or GitHub, okay, he's being redirected to dashboard. Now on dashboard, we can actually fetch the user information and show all the details, all right? So what I'm going to do over here is uh, what we need to do is we need to develop this, right? So right now we are just displaying hello. So here, what I'm going to do is I am uh, going to have a div over here, something like this. This is going to act as a container. Okay. Now within this div, I'm going to have everything that I need on my dashboard. Okay. So here at the top, I can have this title called dashboard over here. All right. And uh, then after this, I can have uh, another div which acts like a container. And within this, I can showcase the user information. Okay, sorry about that. There was a typo. So I can showcase the user information like this. Okay, so I have uh, this thing P, P tag over here. And within this, I can say uh, I can have a strong tag. Okay something like this and uh, within this I can say name okay and uh, I'll close the strong tag after name and then I can say I can display the name over here right so we need to add the logic to display the name I'll just leave it blank for now okay but we are going to display name and I can even display email okay 
and uh, we can even have profile picture. So I'll add the code for profile picture, but for now I'll save this and here you can see name and email appear over here, right? And uh, what we need now is what happens is uh, once the user is logged in, we can query the backend, we can get the user information, right? So here, if you come, okay, so here, if you go to, let's say, okay, we don't have the endpoint, all right? So we just have the endpoint for uh, hello over here, right? So we can have an endpoint defined where the you where the front end can query the backend and it can fetch the user information. Right now we don't have that defined, so we'll define that. But what we would do is once this page loads, the dashboard page, we query the backend because it's successful authentication. We query the backend, we fetch the user information, and then we take that user information and display it onto the screen. Now that user information can be represented via a state over here. So I can have constant and I can say the state name is user and I can say set user over here as the function. I can say use state over here, okay? Now use state, I'm importing this use state. You can see this import was automatically added at the top and uh, this will be null for now, okay? So there's no default value, it's just null, okay? Now what we would do is we would use one more hook. So that we are making use of state, we'll make use of use effect over here okay and uh, I'll, I'll have a use effect defined over here something like this and within this i'm going to have the definition all right so this use effect hook is triggered or uh, when the when the component loads right so what i will do is i uh, okay just get rid of this okay so within this i'm going to make use of something called as axios right now what is Axios? So Axios is essentially a uh, library that enables us to do querying, okay? So before using Axios, I'll just add this over here because we want this to render on the component load, right? And over here, I'll make use of Axios. But for Axios, we also need to install Axios, right? So I'll head over to terminal and I can say npm install Axios, something like this, okay? So this will be added in uh, package.json. If you go over here, you should see Axios being added, right? After you run that, okay? So now we can make use of Axios over here. So I'll say Axios, I'll just disable this. The moment you made use of Axios, you'll see it being imported at the top, okay? So Axios dot, I'm going to make a get request, okay? Now this get request will be made to an endpoint, which will define shortly. But the output of that endpoint will be, okay, it will be uh, a response, right? So what I'm going to do is this should go with credentials, okay? With credentials, I'm, I'm saying with credentials true over here. Now, when we say with credentials, what happens is the request is being done with the authentication information, all right? Uh, over here, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to head over to the new line and I'm going to say then, okay, so after doing this query, you get the response over here, something like this, and what I'm going to do is here, I can say uh, set user, and I'll say response dot data, okay? So whatever response we are getting, it will have data in it, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm updating. So after this querying is done to the backend API, Okay, here we are going to have the API. I don't have that defined yet, all right? But here we are going to have the endpoint after we define it. And then we are going to update the user state over here with the help of this, okay? And then user state is going to have the information that we want to display onto the page, right? Now over here, if you come in, we need to populate this data, right? So what I can do is I can, after leaving a space, I can add, uh, this kind of a syntax and I can say user dot and this will have name over here. Okay, so the data we get will have the name attribute. So I'll add that and I'll add this over here as email. Okay, this is done. Now there will be scenarios wherein this information won't be present uh, or the user object won't be present, right? So what I would do is I would add a condition over here. I would say user. So if user exists only then 
uh, it should uh, actually it should actually render or take uh, or render this uh, all the stuff okay and if the user does not exist so i'll add this over here I'm, I'm making use of ternary operator over here okay then i'm going to simply add this thing over here where i say p okay and i say loading user data something like this okay so i hope this is clear what is happening so here under h2 i'm making use of ternary operator here this entire thing is ternary operator okay yeah so you can see there's a question mark and a colon so i'm checking if user exists if user exists what i'm doing is i'm rendering this right so i can like get the name email i can even display the profile picture if the user information does not exist then we can show this loading user data right so it, it also acts like a loader all right so this is done okay if i save this it it's likely it won't work okay you can see it won't work because i'm getting a status code of 404 the reason is this api does not exist that uh, we have added okay so i'm just seeing this because it's it's loading the user data forever okay now we need to have a valid endpoint over here so that we can query that endpoint and with the help of that endpoint we can get the user information which we can display in the front end all right so what i'm going to do is I'm, i'll come over here i can uh, add a controller over here okay so let me call that controller as the user controller you can call it whatever you want okay and uh, this is of course a rest controller and over here I can say get mapping okay and uh, here I can say user slash info okay so this is the endpoint that I'm having here and uh, here I can say public and uh, I'm returning a map which is of uh, which is having string and object over here okay and uh, I'm saying user this is the name Okay, and uh, let me come over here. I can say return. Okay, so what am I going to return? I'm going to, so first first of all, this thing is going to accept OAuth to user. Okay, so whenever, after authentication, whenever you do a OAuth based authentication, the user is represented by, uh, by the instance of this thing over here. You can see this interface. Okay, so the instance of this will be called as principal. That is what we are going to call. Okay. And this would be auto injected because I'm going to make use of uh, an annotation called authentication principle over here. Okay. And I'm going to say over here. So let me uh, take this to a new line so that it's clear what's happening. Okay. And I can say principle dot get. You can see get attributes. Okay. So get attributes over here. If you see it returns string and object, right? So that is why we have the return type as string and object. Okay, so user is the name of the method. And uh, yeah, we are returning information this way. So we are returning all the attributes with uh, the values as well as the response. Okay, and uh, you, this endpoint can be called later on with uh, from the front end. And you can get the information about the currently authenticated user. So because of authentication principle, will get the information about the currently authenticated user. Okay. So this is also an annotation. Okay. So, so yeah, this is done. I'll just rerun this and I'll take this, uh, take this endpoint and we'll come over here and I'll say HTTP. Okay. And uh, I'll say localhost colon 8080. Okay. Something like this slash user hyphen info. Okay. Now, if you come over here, okay, uh, we are getting an error over here. Network error, it says. So we are seeing this error. Okay, let me try the entire flow again. So if I go to login with Google, I see this error. And if you inspect and see the console, you'll see this error called, uh, okay, course error. All right. So this is a known error. All right. If you have been doing web development. Uh, but but yeah, I, I believe our uh, component is done. We'll, we'll fix this error shortly, but I'll also add a catch block over here. I'll say catch, I'll say error, and uh, 
I'm going to add a curly brace over here and I'll say console dot error over here and uh, I can say error occurred okay and uh, I'll just print the error object okay so I'll say error something like this and uh, yeah we have this and this is handled now the error is handled we won't see that pop up okay because we have the catch block and you can see error occurred and you're getting this error object being printed. All right. Now this error that you're seeing over here is about course. All right. And we need to resolve this issue. So now let us understand this issue that we are getting when fetching the user and let us understand how we can solve it. Right. So here the issue that we are getting here, if you read the message properly, it's saying the, this particular API. Okay. So this call is blocked from this origin. Okay. So this localhost 3000 is the origin. And from here we were making this API call, which is blocked. And this is blocked by course policy. Okay. Now let me ask you a question, which is our front end server host. Okay. So, so our front end URL is localhost 3000. This is the URL, which is our backend URL. The backend URL is localhost 8080. Right. So these are two different domains, right? So we are making a query from localhost 3000 to localhost 8080, right? And this kind of a request where you're making a request from one domain to another domain is known as cross origin request. Okay. Because this is to a different domain than the current one. Okay. So if you're making a request to HTTP localhost slash some URL, okay, that would have been served. But here you are making a request to some other domain and that is why this is blocked. Okay. And this is a security feature. Now, why this is blocked, you might ask is because it's a security feature that is implemented by modern web browsers. And this is done to restrict the web pages from making requests to a domain different than the one that served the web page. So this policy exists, this policy of cross origin exists to protect the users from malicious websites, potentially reading the sensitive data from another domain where they are logged in. Okay. So, so that's the reason why this is implemented. Now there will be some legitimate cases like ours where a web page exists over here on some domain and it wants to make a request across different domain, right? And uh, this is common, especially in uh, modern web applications where you have a separate front-end and back-end web servers running. So this localhost 3000 is where our uh, front end web server is running and localhost 8080 is where our back end server is running, right? So we want our front end react application to communicate and fetch data from the back end server hosted on local host 8080, right? So what we need to do is we need to enable course request in the back end and we need to tell back end that, hey, allow all the requests coming in from localhost 3000. Okay. That is what we need to do. And for that, we need to have a piece of code into our Spring Boot application that will set up the course policy and it will allow all the requests explicitly from this origin. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to head over here to my backend application, of course. And here, what I would do is I would actually, I would hide this first of all. I would create a file, okay? And uh, I'll call this file as webmvc or webconfig, okay? So I'll call this as webconfig, okay? Now this is a file that is going to exist in our backend application, which is going to be a configuration file. So this is a configuration file, okay? Which means Spring Boot will picking the configurations that we have defined in this file, right? And what we are going to do is we are going to have a bean over here of uh, type MVC, web MVC configurer. Okay, so I can say public and uh, I can return web MVC configurer. You can see this over here. Okay, and I can say course config something like this over here. Okay, this is the method name. Okay, I'm getting some line red over here. This is never used. Okay, that's okay. And over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to return a instance of web MVC configurer. So I can say return and uh, I can say new, new web MVC configurer. All right. And uh, here 
you'll see you are being suggested to implement the methods to override right so i'll scroll through this i'm i just want to implement this a method called add course mappings okay so i'll just select this okay you can see it's is being overridden and here i'm going to add a semicolon because i see a red mark here okay now here what we need to do is we need to add some configurations okay so i'll just get rid of this and i'm going to make use of registry so registry is the parameter that is being passed to us over here i'm going to say registry dot add mapping okay and uh, i'm going to say star star okay now what this means is apply this rules to all the urls in the application okay that is what this line says okay so apply the rules whatever i'm defining to all the urls in the application okay that is what star star says and i'm going to say allowed origins okay you can see there are a lot of methods allowed methods allowed headers allowed credentials so i'm going to first say allowed origins okay now which is the origin that i want to allow okay i want to allow this origin right localhost 3000 because i want to say to back in that hey any request coming in from origin is trusted and uh, you can allow it okay so i'm allowing this uh, allowing this particular origin and all the requests from it i also need to define which all methods should be allowed right so i'll say allowed methods which methods should be allowed get so get request should be allowed uh, i should have post also enabled i should have put also enabled okay all right i'm sorry i missed and inverted comma over there okay put i can have delete over here and i can have options as well okay so i'm literally allowing everything okay i'll go to new line i'll say allowed headers okay allowed headers over here okay and i'm going to say star over here because i want to allow all the headers okay i don't want to restrict anything and i'm also going to say dot allow credentials okay because there will be scenarios wherein uh, the front end might pass any sort of credentials like cookies authorization headers so that can be included in these uh, cross origin request and i'm going to end this with a semicolon all right so that's the configuration part that we need to do to enable the cross origin request let me run this and let us see if this actually fixes the issue okay we don't have to call this class from anywhere it's automatically picked up because we have marked it as configuration right now if i come to front end over here okay let me refresh and you should see no issues now right so that cross origin request that we were getting is gone if i close this let me like head over to the home page let me say login with google and you'll see like all the information being fetched from the back end over here okay now let me also give you a demo over here right now if you go over here okay i'm not seeing any sort of urls over here but uh, let me do this again so i'll go to the home page first this is the home page i'll just clear everything you can in the network tab i'll clear everything i'll say login with google so you can see these many network calls were being made okay i'll select fetch xhr so you can see user info was also being called over here right so what happened is uh you can see first uh, you were redirected to the google authorization you can see okay so you were being redirected over here okay and then you were being taken to this uh, login page and that was marked as authenticated so you were being taken to dashboard over here right because you i'm already logged into google from my current session and then over here a api call was being made to user info i got 200 okay as the response and here you can see i got all of this information okay so let me expand this a bit okay what all we are getting okay you can see over here I have uh, some sub this is my profile id i believe is my email verified with google yes it is uh this is the link uh, what is my given name this is my name okay what is my picture the profile picture is also coming over here you can choose to display the picture as well okay you have something called as aud ezp you have name expiry family name and uh, this is some time stamp over here and this is the email so all these information you have in the response from user info and you can display it to the user and that is what we are doing actually okay we are saying dot name over here right 
so dot name when you are saying in the code dot name you can see user dot name okay so here you're seeing user dot name so name is being printed you're seeing user dot email over here right so email is being printed over here right so i hope you have been able to follow along and i hope you have some good clarity as to how you can get this to work uh with the backend integration all right now one more thing i i believe uh, we should uh, do it okay that is to display the image okay we can even display the image of course that's optional but if you wish to you can over here so what i will do is uh, you can come over here uh and you can say user or one second you can have curly braces you can say user dot picture okay so if user dot picture then you can say uh and okay if user dot picture exists only then you will show the image tag okay so i'll say image over here space src and what is the src src is uh user dot oh sorry it's not use effect it's user dot picture something like this over here you can have the alternate tag over here elt over here you can say user profile okay and uh, you also need to add a referer policy referer policy you can set to no referer okay so if you don't add this referer policy what would happen is the uh, the image won't be loaded because you'll get some course error again okay it's because you're fetching the image directly from google right so i've added that just for the safer side if i save this and if you come over here you can see f being loaded so you can see picture exist right so this is being loaded and you can see the url over here is from google right so you might get course error if you just remove this so if i just remove this if i save this if i come here you will see i'm not getting okay it's it's loading okay so there's no issue as such i believe but i will still add it okay because if tomorrow i get an issue i'll just keep it over here okay so so yeah this is uh, about uh, how you can display the image as well okay so whatever profile picture you have in your application that would be displayed over here right so i hope you have been able to follow along as to how this integration is working for oauth and i hope uh, this is useful for you all so now it's time we can do some final touches to our application and uh, improve the interface of our app so there are a few minor improvements that i can think of is centering this and making use of some nice icons with this buttons so that these look professional okay of course i'm not going to beautify a lot okay but i'm just going to make it much more presentable so now over here first thing that i'm going to do is we can center this so i can come over here okay and uh, here uh, this component is the home right so here what we can do is i can have a object with a style over here okay so this is the object that i have defined already with uh, the css that we need to center style or centering the content okay so i'm making use of properties like display flex direction align items justify content and height okay now over here what i'm going to do is i am going to make use of this so i'm going to say div and here i can say style is equal to center style the moment i save this and if i come over here you can see uh this is now centered okay now i can add some style individually to the buttons okay so let me take make it a little bit little bit aligned like this okay and here what i can do is i can say uh style okay one second so style over here and i can add styles like uh, i can say margin over here and margin can be of uh, 10 pixel let us see how this looks okay there is some spacing out there okay now after adding ma margin i can even uh, change the font size so i can say font size over here and uh, font size can be of uh, 16 pixel i can set if you come okay this looks decent and uh, you can have padding essentially so i can have okay i can have padding over here padding can be of uh, 10 pixel over there 
okay so we have this uh, button okay and i'm going to replicate this similar style for the login with github button as well okay so i'm going to just copy this over here this entire thing and i'll scroll this okay and uh, over here i can say enter in this style over here, okay and i'll just align this better okay so that uh, it looks good okay just comes to the new line okay something like this okay so this is done and uh, if i save this you have a decent looking buttons okay you can of course customize this even further okay but what we can even do is we can add icons over here like login with google and login with github and for that we can make use of uh, react icons okay so if you search for react icons you'll see a page uh, this this page over here this is the official website if you come over here okay this is a way to include popular icons in your react projects easily okay so so here let's say if i search for google okay you can see the icon of google here okay you can see and uh, you can make use of this uh, there is icon for github as well okay so what i would do is i would come over here and we would need to install this first of all so i'll head over to terminal and i would say npm install react icons something like this we should see the package json being updated you can see package json being updated so the dependencies have been added i'll just collapse this and then over here what i'm going to do is i'm going to make use of uh, the icons from this okay so i can say over here import and uh, one icon that we should use is fc google this is from react icons and uh, i'll also need import okay i can say fa github something like this okay now if you copy this fc google and if you come to the browser and if you search for fc google here you can see fc google up here this is the icon it's a colorful one so the other one that we saw was not colorful so if you search for google you can see fc google over here okay here this is fa google is non-colored one if you search for github okay github icon if you search uh, you have a lot of options okay i accidentally misspelled you have lots of options okay but i'll just make use of fa github okay you can make use of any any uh, icon of your choice okay and you can copy the name and you can import it so you can import it this way you can see the code as well okay so so yeah i'm making use of this one okay fa github now we need to use it into our buttons so what i would do is i would come over here scroll down okay and just before login with google i'm going to say uh, over here fc google something like this okay and i'm just going to have the closing tag here okay just get rid of this this is done and i'll have space and uh, you can copy this and add it over here and this can be fa github just save this and come over here to our browser and see the application this should look far more decent right so this is looking better now as compared to the earlier one okay we have not done a lot of ui tweaks but but yeah little bit presentable i would say okay if you click on google you again have that dashboard okay which is not beautified that's fine but but yes i hope with this we have a complete picture of how oauth works with google and how you can beautify a react page and make use of react icons into your application